Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. We have a lot to talk about. Unfortunately, uh, for my sister Janet, we have some science to discuss because we had one of the coolest papers uh, in a long time. So this is the cover of Cell, which is one of our top uh, journals. And what it shows is uh, a half of the back half of an elephant and the front half of a woolly mammoth because some of our scientists figure out, figured out <laughs> why one's woolly and one's not. And I just got back from Botswana, so I'm very familiar with our elephants, actually 138,000 elephants in Botswana. So what's interesting is uh, Ares Lieberman Aden and his colleagues uh, took a sample from a 52,000 year old woolly mammoth uh, skin sample. These went extinct. And, and they have collaborators in Stockholm working with them. And, and to understand the importance of this, so you have to sort of step back and understand uh, how cells work. So this is an electron micrograph of a cell and in the nucleus right there. And, you know, for those of us who, who learn about uh, nucleic acid and DNA structure, we often think of it in linear terms. So we're all familiar with the double helix and the base pairs, uh, A, T, C, and G, that we sort of think about when we think of how the DNA encodes uh, RNA, we think of it almost like a sentence where you can read it along uh, in a linear fashion, but actually that's not how it works because uh, DNA is not linear. And there, there is about, if you think about the DNA, if you were to string it end to end, there's about two meters of DNA, about that much, and it has to s sit in a six micron nucleus, that little picture I showed you. This uh, nucleus is usually around six microns. So what, how big is that? Well, if you think about a millimeter being a thousandth of a meter, a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. And so it's six of those little six microns wide, and you've got to stick all that two meters of DNA. It's almost like taking a 24-mile long string and putting it into a tennis ball. So about 10 years ago, one of our investigators, Ayers Lieberman Aiden, and here's a picture of him holding what looks like a, uh, a tennis ball, which is his uh, image of, of the DNA three-dimensional structure, structure, how it's wrapped in it. And the reason this was so, such an important breakthrough uh, on his work was because normally when we thought about uh, regulation of DNA in a linear fashion, the thing that turns on uh, a, a gene to, to start transcription, we can almost think of it as a light switch. And the things down, downstream from that that modulate that light switch, almost like a rheostat, are enhancers that are, you know, physically distant, except if you think about uh, three-dimensional structure where uh, the DNA is actually folded. And so if you think about multiple folds, as in this uh, example, it, it can bring the rheostat much closer to the, the light switch. And so there's lots of different ways the regulators can be now in touch with the, 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 with the actual genes themselves. And that was one of the breakthroughs that its group uh, came up with. The second big breakthrough is if it's all wound in a ball like that, how do you actually read it? And the way you read it is there are these sort of uh, processing circles that bring the strand through, and that's how you can actually unfold the, the complicated structure and, and read it out. So why is that important? Well, it's important to understand the discovery on the woolly uh, mammoth. So what they discovered was that, um, from, and these are collaborators from Copenhagen in Spain, what they discover is what these, this ancient, these ancient chromosomes that they isolated from the, the skin of woolly mammoth uh, actually retain their three-dimensional structure. So while it's very difficult to understand, these DNA fragments are actually very similar to the ones that are in humans. And the, the interesting thing is in the woolly mammoth, they have the exact same number of chromosomes in, in modern elephants, 28 pairs. And what was interesting is that the regulatory elements that are responsible for hair follicle development are completely different in the woolly mammoth than in, in the elephant. So clearly, one of the major differences in evolution is those regulatory elements for hair development disappeared or, or changed. And so it's, it's kind of amazing that you can isolate uh, DNA, the structure, actually what's essentially like a beef jerky. It's just a piece of old skin that's been, uh, uh, it's been around for a long time. Anyway, it's so a really great, interesting news, great breakthrough. Uh, so let's uh, talk about uh, what's going on with uh, bird flu and other infections. 
A uh, lot of stuff going on. Four poultry workers in, Cal in Colorado have now been uh, diagnosed with H5N1. That brings to a total of nine reported cases since 2022. Similar to the other cases, the, the, their illness was mild, a little fever, runny nose, and often uh, conjunctivitis or red eyes. Uh, and these, far these particular workers were actually working on poultry farms with infected birds. So as of July, uh, there are now 152 dairy herds in 12 states that are infected and hundreds of commercial poultry flocks in more than 30 states uh, have H5N1. So, you know, it's, it's sort of like <laughs> creeping up on us. It's, it's been in, it's in wild birds, it's gotten into our, uh, our poultry uh, farms and it's in dairy cattle. So I wouldn't be surprised if we begin to see somehow a transition into an infectious disease in man, but we're hopefully prepared for it. A uh, lot of discussion about since dairy cattle are infected, can I get it from milk? Well, pasteurized milk uh, gets rid of it, so or at least denatures the virus. So there's no concern if you're drinking pasteurized milk. But if you're drinking unpasteurized milk, there's a lot of concern. So there's an NIH study that came out that showed that mice given raw samples from infected cows actually got infected uh, themselves. And there was a CDC report of a, a, of a cat that had died drinking raw milk from infected cows. So it's clear that the virus can be transmitted in raw milk. So it's very important from, for people living on farm or in, in dairy, near dairies that they be sure to only drink pasteurized milk. Uh, so there's also news from TEFI, our, our famous Texas epidemic, uh, epidemic Public Health Institute. H5N1, that virus continues to be detected in levels in Texas, probably through, because it's a wastewater analysis, it's probably contaminated from infected dairy cattle. Uh, West Nile virus uh, continues to be detected in low levels, uh, and we have had one case in Houston I reported last week. SARS-CoV-2 is beginning to increase in Texas, and interestingly enough, monkeypox is still being detected in the Houston and Austin areas. So these are the reports from TEFI, and what you can see, we, we've talked about this the last couple of weeks, uh, enterovirus D68 continues to be high, as does parainfluenza. Uh, and those two viruses cause a pretty significant upper respiratory infection, you know, a, a summer cold. The, I mentioned mpox, and last week I mentioned echovirus E11, which is really more important for neonates, it's in, they get it from their mothers. Uh, influenza A, which was, you know, are no longer in the influenza season, but this is important. It's not, in, not uh, increasing now. We'll see it in the fall. But when the peak came, uh, we did take to, uh, an opportunity to sequence those viruses, and I'll give you some data on that. And you can see SARS-CoV-2 is beginning to increase. So I mentioned influenza A. If you go and sequence all those viruses during the peak of influenza in the winter, what you can see is mostly it was H1N1, which was in the vaccine but also H3N2, which was not in the vaccine last year, but is intended to be in the vaccine this coming fall. So that's part of the way uh, experts can predict what's gonna happen is you look at what happened last year, and because H3N2 is there in the influenza A group, we'll probably have that as part of the vaccine in the fall. So the interesting thing about COVID is it never seems to go away. It's, now, it's increasing again and pretty substantially in the wastewater nationally, and now we're at it's being reported as high in, in the wastewater in the nation. I mentioned Texas, this, is, this yellow line is, the, is Texas, where actually they have more of an increase than the rest of the country. So once again, Texas leading the way in things we don't want to lead the way in, hurricanes, misery, and West Nile, influenza, COVID-19, unbelievable. Anyway. So the, the, the leading indicators are test positivity and emergency room visits, both up in Texas and in the United States. Uh, and the severity indicator is really hospitalizations and in the US it continues to increase. And it is the same uh, viruses, variants that we talked about before, the FLIRT variants, uh, KP3 and KP2. You can see JN1, you know, which was the dominant uh, strain last year, almost gone, now it's all the FLIRT variants. Uh, so we'll see what happens. And this is one of the reasons I think these developed here. Last week I talked about the wastewater coming out of uh, uh, international flights. They still had a significant amount of JN1, where we've already flipped over completely to the flirt variants. So I want to end today with a couple of shout outs. First of all, 
Congratulations to Dr. Beacon Boskert, who's the director of the Women's Center for Heart Failure Research and vice chair of the Department of Medicine. She has been selected as a recipient of the American Car College of Cardiology 2024 Bar Award of Excellence. Uh, this is a very prestigious award that is presented annually to someone who demonstrates extraordinary excellence, vision, and leadership in advancing healthcare. So congratulations to you, Beacom. Uh, it's a great honor. And then also to Mandeep Bajai, Professor of Medicine, Endocrinology, who received the Banting Medal for Leadership and Service from the American Diabetes Association. And this is awarded to a leader in, in, from the American Diabetes Association. He's president this past year, a uh, very highly meritorious career that was being uh, acknowledged. And finally, I want to end today with just a uh, big shout out to everybody in Houston, uh, not just our own faculty and students and uh, staff, but everyone in Houston who's really kind of suffered the last 11 days have been absolutely awful. Uh, it's been, you know, incredibly hot. We, a lot of people haven't had their, their power on. There's still a lot of work ahead, but, you know, as always, Houston's a very resilient city. So we're all thinking about everybody in Houston. We all have to stick together. And I hope everyone gets their power on soon. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>